In this message, we will discuss about spontaneous and prophetic worship. We will discover how we as a church can journey into this aspect of worship. Our worship to God is more than moments or events filled with songs, music and dance. Worship is truly a life of consecration to God, lived with a heart that's totally devoted to Him. We're going to look at one scripture before we do our declaration. And I'd like us to turn to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 24, please. Proverbs 16 and verse 24 says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. So when pleasant words are spoken, when pleasant words are received, it is sweetness to the soul. You know, I think uh, a couple of Sundays back, we looked at how words impact our emotions. The soul talks about our emotions, our intellect, our imagination. It is sweetness to the soul. And then it says, it is also health to the bones. Pleasant words are health to the bones. So the words we speak affect our emotions. The words we speak and declare affect our health. Amen. So when we look at it that way, that our mood, our health, our bodies are actually nurtured by God's word. You know, the Lord himself said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the Father. So when we declare the word, when we declare God's word, when we confess God's word over our lives, over our situations, over our families, you know, it is sweetness to the soul. It changes our mood. It changes our thinking. It changes our emotions. And it is also health to our bones. Amen? So uh, let's stand up and let's make our declaration. But let's do it through the week, right? Let's uh, hold up Bibles high and say this out loud. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word. And I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So say something nice to the person next to you. Just declare the word of God. You know, just say, God loves you. God bless you. You know, God is your provider. He is your breakthrough. He is your banner. Amen. There's so much you can say. There's so much you can declare. And, you know, your faces, you know, our faces, our expressions change when we declare the word of God. Right? Um, right. So we just move into uh, what we've been studying. And we pick up from what we left off a couple of weeks back. We've been studying about worship. Uh, the first Sunday we looked at how worship is uh, uh, our reverence of God, recognition of who God is, and, and so on. Uh, second Sunday we looked at the various expressions of worship and how we are, as our identity, you know, as priests, we go before Him with a sacrifice. And that sacrifice is praise and thanksgiving. And we looked at uh, the different expressions of praise, you know, some things that we need to get into, something that we can, you know, be better at, something that we can grow into. And all that, you know, is, uh, is because it's coming from a heart that's engaging with God. It's coming from a heart that has a relationship with God. So expression of praise, uh, we looked at all that. And um, this Sunday, uh, we, uh, today, we're going to look at a couple of Aspects And if you notice, we, we're looking at worship from different angles every Sunday. Um, so today we're going to look at uh, worship as something that's prophetic in nature. Meaning, in worship, in our times of worship, the Spirit of God can speak the heart and mind of God to our hearts. 
And what the prophetic word does, the prophetic song does as well. And as a congregation, we can declare, we can sing the heart and mind of God over our situations. And, and God wants to do that in the here, in the now. Right? But we're also going to look at how worship is much bigger than the songs we sing. How worship is even much bigger than, you know, even much bigger than prophetic worship. Much bigger than, you know, the time we spend here. It's much bigger than that. Okay, so, um, are you ready? Okay, uh, so just need your... Um, endurance and patience. We're going to look at two aspects. Okay, so are we ready? Okay, okay, let's dive right in. Um, we see that music and worship go together, right? We looked at that Hebrew word, zamar, which talks about how we can play an instrument musically to God in an act of worship, right? And how we can use music to accompany the songs that we sing. So God is not against music. A lot of musical instruments which are listed there and in, in the Psalms, Psalm 149, Psalm 150, a whole list there. So we use music to praise God, to worship Him. We also see that there is a very close link between music and the prophetic. So uh, one example is uh, the prophet Elisha. King Jehoshaphat goes to prophet Elisha with two other kings for a word from the Lord, for counsel. And the prophet Elisha does something very strange. He says, okay, now bring me a musician. And the musician comes and the musician, musician starts playing. And the prophet says, and, and then we read in 2 Kings, we read that uh, 3.13, I think, and 14 and so on. We read that the hand of the Lord comes upon Elisha. And Elisha says, thus says the Lord. So the musician plays. The hand of the Lord comes upon Elisha, and Elisha says, thus says the Lord. Meaning that when that music is played, when that certain kind of music was played, Elisha experienced the hand of the Lord. Elisha experienced the presence of God. And Elisha received the heart and mind of God. He received the word of the Lord in his heart. And then he stirred up and he says, thus says the Lord. He prophesies. And uh, nowhere is it so clearly, you know, the whole thing of music and worship and the prophetic, all these three elements coming together we see in the tabernacle of David. And when we, uh, you know, the tabernacle that David built, you know, we all studied about the tabernacle of Moses. What happens is the, um, the, ta the, the Ark of the Covenant, right, where the presence of God was and God would speak, Right? The, in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the priest would go and God would speak. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was taken away by the Philistines when Israel actually, they go to war with the Philistines. They go to war. They take the Ark of the Covenant. They take it like a good luck charm. They say, okay, I'm, I'm with this. You know, sometimes people hang, you know, certain things in the car, uh, cross hanging, you know, certain other things on the dashboard so that I don't, you know, nothing happens, you know, a lime. So Israel goes to war with the Ark of the Covenant, and they get beaten very badly, but the Ark of the Covenant is also taken by the Philistines. So it remains there with the Philistines, and then comes back to Israel, and it's there for a long time. King David, he says, I need to bring back the Ark. So he brings back the Ark, and he puts up what is called the Tabernacle of David, what we call as the Tabernacle of David, which later becomes a temple. So what he does is he institutes a form of worship. He puts the ark there, he appoints certain people to play music, to sing songs of worship, because the ark, he knew there was something about the ark, because it represented the presence of God. He said, I want this. I want to engage with the presence of God. For me, worship is engaging with God's heart, with his presence. So he, he institutes that worship, and he goes all out. And we read about it in um, 1 Chronicles 25. He just goes all out. He, uh, he appoints 288 singers. He appoints 4,000 musicians. He puts some 4,000 gatekeepers. And uh, worship time is not just two hours. It's not just four hours. It's not just three nights of worship. But it's continuous, 24-7, extravagant. And we see... Uh, some things that are there, you know, people, they cast lots. We see the first worship team roster. They cast lots, they come, 
And teams would come, they would lead in worship. Worship would go on 24-7 continuously. And um, we also see that there will be certain people who are appointed as leaders, worship leaders. We read about people like Asaph, Jeduthun, Haman. And uh, there's another man by name, Kenaniah, who was in charge of the music, what kind of music was played. He was in charge of the songs that were sung. But the interesting thing is this. You know, time and again, we see that they played music and they prophesied. They played music, they worshipped, they prophesied. Which means they were declaring the heart and mind of God. Prophecy is just God speaking to man through man. God revealing. He could be telling about the future, it could be telling about the present. But his heart, he's revealing to man through man. And, and these people, this team, these teams were doing that. We see in... Um, um, First Chronicles 25 verse 1, you know, uh, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthen, who should prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. We see the same thing in verse 2, who prophesied according to the order of the king. Verse 3 talks about Jeduthen, who prophesied with a harp. So they were prophesying. They were playing, they were prophesying. So we see that this kind of worship was happening. Another interesting thing is that the psalmist, David, would write these psalms, write these songs. He would give it to this team and say, okay, you sing it unto God. So they would sing these songs. And um, many of the psalms were actually birthed or uh, inspired in that atmosphere of worship. So God would give them the words. God would give them, inspire those words, and they would sing it out. So we see that prophecy, worship, Music, everything coming together at that time. And this continued for 33 years during the time of his reign. And also continued after that in the form of the temple. And we, interestingly, we see many kings who come and who reinstitute this kind of worship. It was continuous, it was prophetic, and it was big, it was grand, etc. Now, the point we're making is this. When we come to Acts chapter 15... The, all the, uh, you know, the, the first disciples, they're all gathered here. They have a problem in church. You know, should the, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people who come to the Lord, should they be circumcised or not? Should they keep the law of Moses or not? So they have a committee meeting. They're all gathered together. All the elders are there. And uh, when they're discussing it, James, he refers to a prophecy made, made by Amos. And he says, God is rebuilding the temple the tabernacle of David. I just want to read that verse out. Acts chapter 15 and verses 13 onwards. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And he refers to Amos, um, uh, the prophecy made by Amos. He says, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Verse 17, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So the Lord is rebuilding in our day and time the Davidic form of worship. He's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Amen. And in a way, we are, the church is the tabernacle of David, given to worship in this manner. And, uh, you know, all over the world, there are uh, movements of worship and intercession uh, 24-7, which are coming up everywhere. And International House of Prayer is just one part, you know, one ministry. Uh, I don't know for how many decades, maybe 20 years, whatever. They, you know, there's nonstop praise and worship and intercession that's happening. Teams come, they lead. And that's worship that's happening to God. And um, so we see that God is rebuilding the tabernacle. So the worship time is, is a time where God wants to speak his heart and mind to us. And prophecy is simply God speaking to us through man. And prophecy can come in very, very different ways. You know, God can put it in, his, in our hearts in very different ways. You know, we, first of all, 
we need to know that this is God's word and this is God speaking to us. You know, nothing can take that place. But God wants to speak to, the, to us in the here and now. And he wants to lead us by his spirit in the here and now. And sometimes there is an impression in our hearts. Like, you know, how you put a thumb impression, you know, you just, just press that and you leave it and there's an impression. God puts something in our heart. Sometimes there's a flash of information, somebody's name, some, uh, somebody's face. The Spirit of God does that. You see through Scripture, you see that. And sometimes it, it, could, be, um, it could be a quickening of Scripture. For some reason, you know, a line comes. You know, as we were making the declaration, I, I just saw a pair of glasses. And just for a minute, I was just wondering, God, what is it? You know, and I, I just believe that God, you know, is sharpening our focus as a congregation, maybe as individuals, just sharpening our focus on Him. You know, sharpening our focus, things that are blurred, things that are not clear. You know, God is bringing us into that focus. And God puts that in our hearts. God speaks to us in, maybe sometimes it's a word, a word could be visual, a word could be something that's audible. You know, when we went for the um, mission trips, we were teaching on prophecy. And, and uh, there were some who said, you know, I just got this word. You know, there were some who were prophesying for the first time. She said, I got this word. So we, we asked, okay, how did you get this word? Some would say, I saw this word. I saw it visually. I saw this word. And some would say, I, it was like an impression in my heart. I don't know. It just came up, this word. It's bubbled up. Right? It could be a word. It could be a sentence. It could be a paragraph. But God is speaking, quickening. He could do it when we are awake, like right now. He could do it when we are asleep. Some of us right now. <laughs> he could do it, you know, in our dreams. And, and Scripture talks about that. But the thing is, God speaks. God speaks. He quickens the word. And all of us, we need to check with the word and see if it's, if it's lined with the word. So God speaks in different ways. But what does this prophetic word do? You know, don't I have the word of God? Can't I just live by the principles? What does the prophetic word do? 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3 says that the prophetic word brings edification. It builds us up. There's spiritual progress. You know, it's like going into the gym, doing a bench press, coming out. You know, you're all pumped. It just builds us up. It brings edification. It brings encouragement, exhortation. We are encouraged. And it brings comfort. You know, today, as we were declaring, you know, God, he's, he's with you. He's not, you know, you're never alone. What is that? The word coming, you know, for someone here in our congregation saying, God is with us. Maybe, you know, you came with a question, you know, God, are you there? And here's the answer. I'm with you. God speaks to us. Um, so it brings edification, exhortation, comfort. Um, you know, we see that the prophetic word also reveals plans and purposes of God. You know, the first time I stepped into church, all people's church, you know, I think I've shared this before, but first time I stepped in, it was in 2001, September, uh, church was not like this. Uh, they were, you know, it was, we came for a three-day meeting. Um, and uh, we, we just came uh, invited by a friend, Pastor Georgie, to, uh, to lead in worship, right? So we came and uh, just, uh, we saw, okay, a lot of empty chairs, three families. Okay, church, let's start. Saw Pastor Ashes, you know, standing in front. And there was a guest speaker that time. So, so we, we, we led in worship. We finished. And uh, I remember I was working with this company, so I, I just went out. I think there were some missed calls that I needed to, you know, some clients, and I was in sales that time. So I just went out to make this call, and uh, Arthi, my wife, you know, came and said, um, that speaker is, is calling, us, you know, calling us, come. So just quickly went back in, and uh, anyway, feeling a little conscious because, you know, three families, everybody's looking at you. Just went right to the front, and, uh, you know, this, this person said, you know, God is calling you to be a pastor. You know, you just see the humor of it all, right? God is calling you to be a pastor. And uh, the, at that time, I didn't have any uh, plans of being a pastor. No, you know, nothing at all. It was not there in the horizon at all. 
right? I was working in sales, I was doing okay, not a great performer, but doing okay, meeting targets, getting incentives, comfortable traveling, you know, all those things are happening, but I was living a double life. Uh, that was something that God had to clean up, and he did, but here comes the prophetic word. A revelation of his plans and purposes. And um, I'm amazed at times, you know, uh, uh, to be doing what I'm doing, and I think, God, you know, your plans, God, so amazing. Uh, I wouldn't have just, not in my wildest dreams, you know, would I have thought that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. So God speaks to us. So at the time of prophetic saying, this could be released, the plans of God, the purposes of God. It brings correction and restoration. King David, he has this, um, you know, he, the one who writes, or wrote all these psalms, he falls in sin, sins greatly. Adultery, murder, and then goes through life as if nothing's happening. And God sends Prophet Nathan. God sends Prophet Nathan with a message. Nathan goes before King David and starts telling him a story. Like you know that story. There's a rich man, there's a poor man. The rich man took what was with a poor man. The only thing that he had and you know, um, took that lamb and prepared a meal, etc., so King David is very angry, you know, you know, who is this? How can this injustice happen in my, in my kingdom? Show me that person. And Prophet Nathan says, O king, it is you. So the Lord reveals the secrets. And then he goes and he, he declares. But the best part is this, that there is restoration. There is repentance, there is restoration. There is correction. The woman at the well has this conversation with the Lord. And the Lord, the word of knowledge, you know, he says, yes, you're right. The man with whom you're living is not your husband. You're right in saying that you're not married, but you've, you were married before. And then she knows that something is happening. These words are not spoken in condemnation. But it's spoken in a, in a gracious manner, and that's the prophetic word. You know, sometimes we are very scared. Oh, I go before this man of God. Oh, what I did last night, <laughs> what I saw last night, he's going to say it. But you're really surprised. God is saying, I have great plans for you. And you're like, oh, false prophet. <laughs> but the, the thing is this, God's words are so gracious. doesn't mean that, you know, what he said undone, what he did not say, what he left unsaid, you know, that's not true. That's not, that's not something that we need to deal with. Yes, we need to. But this is how God speaks. The prophet, he wants to bring us back, wants to restore our lives, bring us to a place of repentance because he wants us to come back to him. The prophetic word also transforms nations. You know, um, Ezekiel uh, 37, we read about this, and God saying, Ezekiel, what do you see? God, I, all I see are bones. Another question, Ezekiel, can these bones live? No, it's like, duh. <laughs> what should I answer? God, you know the answer. And God says, prophesy, Ezekiel. Speak to those bones, Ezekiel. Because I'm going to do something. I'm going to put sinew, I'm going to put flesh, I'm going to put skin, I'm going to put life. And there arises a mighty army. And it's talking about the nation of Israel. He's saying, prophesy, Ezekiel. Speak to those dry bones, speak to those bones. The nation needs to rise up. And God did that. God restored that nation. So uh, the prophetic word, you know, it does bring... Exhortation, edification, comfort, but it also transforms nations because it's the word of God. Now we know that the God is perfect. The prophetic word that he releases is perfect. But the vessel through whom he releases is in the process of being perfected, you and I. Right? So sometimes we do hear one thing and we, yeah, we just, you know, maybe we declare it, we say it in a different way, but we are in the pathway of being perfected. But the thing is, God is saying, you know, when we read 1 Thessalonians 5, do not despise the prophecies. Some of us have, a, have maybe had a bad experience with prophetic, bad experience with all that, and say, I don't want any of this. 
But the word of God is saying, do not despise prophecies. You receive it, you test it, you check it, you apply it. But if there's no confirmation, just leave it, right? The, the interesting thing is that the prophetic can be released in song. The prophetic word can be released in a song through us. And um, the way it starts, it, it could be a very spontaneous song. A song for which you did not know the words. For, a song for which the lyrics are not there on the screen. A spontaneous song. A song that is just coming out of the overflow of our heart. We experience the love of God and there's the overflow and you just put words and you start singing out. And everybody sings, yes or no? Everybody sings. We sing in different environments. It could be the bathroom. It could be on the road. It could be when, you know, nobody's there. But all of us sing. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, you sing. You know, it's true. Right? All of us do. And the best place to release your song is right here. Before God. Not all of us are called to maybe lead in singing because sometimes, um, you know, it can be a distraction. It can be a hindrance for people. But the thing is that all of us can sing. And all of us need to sing, right? Um, because it doesn't say, oh, you have a great voice, you sing. No, we sing to the Lord a love song, um, a song that, uh, a, a song we, we sing because of the new thing that he does in us. Psalm 33 and verse 3, sing to him a new song, something that you didn't learn. Psalm 40 and verse 3 says, he has put a new song in my mouth. So here's another thing. When it comes to prophetic songs, the Lord gives us a song to sing it back to him. He says, okay, here are the words. You sing it back now. Sing it back. Here's the tune, you sing it back. And Deuteronomy chapter uh, 31 talks about this, chapter 31 and verse 19. Uh, the, Lord tell, the Lord tells Moses, Now therefore write down this song for yourselves. Now God, who's so creative, uh, he tells Moses, Moses, write down this song. He gives him the words. He says, teach it to the children of Israel, put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Verse 22, therefore... Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. So songs that the Lord gives. In Hebrews, we see, Hebrews chapter 2, we see another aspect of this song. Songs that the Lord sings to the Father. You know, something that, um, you know, slightly diffi different to, difficult to wrap our minds around, but it says here, Hebrews 2 and verse 11, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Prophetic songs could be for people. Prophetic songs, again, could be to the powers of darkness, to nations. We declare it. And the prophetic song accomplishes all that the prophetic word accomplishes. Amen. Amen. So it brings edification, brings correction, you know, gives a surge of faith, gives us motivation to do the work of God, to go on in life, put so much of hope in us, encouragement. The prophetic song does that. So it could be something new, something spontaneous that we just sing, or it could be that song for that moment. That song for that moment, you know, maybe the ones who are ministering, the team did not plan that, but it's a song that we know. It's a song that we've learned. It's a song that we already sing, but that is sung at that time, and it's the most appropriate, the right fit, the right song, because God knows the hearts and minds of the people, and uh, he wants to release that song. So we see that prophetic songs are sung. Prophetic songs need to be part of our worship times. And uh, I think we've seen, you know, uh, glimpses of that, uh, a trickle of that, a drizzle of that here and there, but we can step in to more, more of it. And some practical guidelines is to, um, you know, how we can prepare is, you know, it starts with a relationship with God, of course. You know, we're not doing this as an exercise. Okay, song number one, two, now prophetic song. No, it starts having, uh, the key is relationship. We walk with God. 
because the words that he whispers in our hearts we declare it out the lord says right says what i speak to you in your ears you declare it from the rooftop to hear him speak to us in our ears we need to have a close walk if somebody is there and if they whisper to me i can't hear but if i grow near and i walk with them and they whisper i can hear so i need to have a close walk with him to hear the whispers of his heart i need to have depth in word and prayer spending time in word spending time in prayer and um um because the word gives the boundaries so i don't sing anything which is outside of god you know the prophetic word is in line with the word of god it can't be outside of the word of god because his will his desire his heart his mind is in line with his written word so if we you know as a church as a ministry team we are, we have depth in the word okay this is the heart and mind of god this is what the word of god says then when these thoughts come when god speaks to us you know we we will go with it we will be mindful of it we will catch it we will hold it and we will release that so a depth in word a depth in word also the holy spirit you know is able to draw this out and release it it's like fuel you know the word word is in us the revelation of god is in us the holy spirit just draws it out and releases and that's the right word for that moment it could be scripture it could be uh, a truth from scripture the holy spirit releases that so this applies to those of us who are ministering in worship and also for those of us in church who you know uh, in in the congregation secondly we come with expectation you know it's not just to be prepared but we come with expectation you know when we come to church for some of us you know it's a big accomplishment i've reached church hallelujah i can you know, my day is set you know i you know it's we, we go through all kinds of things right um uh for some of us it's it's a great big challenge but uh the thing is this that we come with a heart that is expectant with a heart that is tuned to god you say god you speak what are you saying god to be sensitive to the whisper of the holy spirit to be sensitive a lot of things could take our focus off a lot of things could distract us you know things could be i remember once um, i may share this um, uh, we were actually leading at uh, apc south jayanagar and it was a different location the first location actually the older location and um, you know that we used to turn the volume all the way up because we didn't have uh, monitors you know to hear so the team the we had to rely on the song the sound hitting the wall and coming back so we used to have things pretty loud in the morning uh doing worship so wo- volume was really loud and this person walked in uh with her hands like this and she sat right through the worship time like this and so you know there could be things and now i was very distracted when i saw that i said like, oh god you know what do i do next uh but the thing is there could be things like that happening but don't get distracted let our focus be on god be sensitive to what the holy spirit is saying spirit in your heart and and uh, when we are sensitive when we are expectant when we are prepared then we we are able to just receive we are able to catch what the spirit of god is saying some um, you know practical guidelines is this like when sometimes what happens is the worship team you know as a worship team we just say okay why don't you just sing out to the lord you know just say why don't you sing out your song to the lord this team is just playing musically so all of us we what do we do we sing out right we sing out to the lord nothing complex something very simple just sing out to the lord what is in your heart you know uh, instead of speaking it out sing it out as simple as that secondly uh, something that we can do is sing out in tongues just between you and god just sing out in tongues okay i don't have the words now i i just sing out in tongues you sing out in tongues sing a song in tongues to the lord um one way to greatly practice this is um 
you know when you know the tune of a song okay a well known tune but you put your own words there okay let's uh, let's say a song like um a uh, song like bless the lord of my soul okay there are 10000 reasons bless the lord of my soul now you know the words of the song but you put your words god i love you lord i love you lord could be just one line just sing it all over again what happens is when we start doing that in our times of personal worship you realize that you're actually opening up to god putting those words in us god putting his thoughts in us and we begin to get these words and we start singing that out over and over again okay sometimes what happens is uh, the team you know the worship leader is singing one line and everybody's like oh we are stuck now you know you we used to have those gramophone records i don't know you know we had in those days and sometimes it just goes to a rut if it's an old record and it's just on that line and you need to just put it to the next groove and then it moves right so sometimes it's like that and you're wondering how many times yeah you sung it but you know we forget that when we were in kindergarten you know you went and the teacher you know showed the board and said a for apple and you said it over a one that whole year i think no a for apple everybody said a for apple the next day a for apple we said it we said it so many times what does repetition do it helps us to learn it reinforces the truth it gives it it lays emphasis on the truth the lord says verily verily i say unto you it means sit up and take notice this is important there's something that's happening so many times we sing it the first time and our hearts are not actually gripped our hearts are not engaged we sing it and then we sing it the second time we are thinking about something else a hey, nice tune nice words we sing it the third time and and slowly hey i never saw it this way before and we sing it the fourth time and then you know we are opening up and saying god i love you lord and i lift my voice we are now engaged so when it's repetition of course there are times when we err on the side of repetition and sing it for the sake of repetition um uh, you know uh, that also happens at times so when the lines are repeated i just grab maybe you don't know that line sing it out sing it out amen okay uh, will you sing it out okay awesome so when the lines are repeated when there's emphasis sing it out uh, our media team can actually put the lyrics on the team on the on the screen when they hear that okay this is what the team is going this is what the team is doing uh, the media team can actually put the lyrics on the screen and then we can sing that out now now everybody is engaged everybody sees that and we sing it out and it's the truth that it's proclaimed it's the word of god that is the heart of god the mind of god which is declared and it has its impact amen amen and uh, sometimes there are specific words of knowledge which are declared then we test it we check with the word of god and we release that so it's a very powerful very powerful uh gift and tool which god has put it it's in the bible it's in the word maybe some of us have stepped into uh worshiping god in this manner but i just want to encourage all of us as a church to step in and worship god even as he puts these songs in our hearts but the interesting thing is this that worship is even bigger than that i'm not contradicting myself prophetic has its place sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving has its place right revering god recognition of god yes we need to do that but worship is much bigger than that it's bigger than that it's bigger than the song it's bigger than us coming and gathering like this it's bigger than that because many times you know uh, i used to know one person who said you know at this day on this day at this time i'll be doing this jex you call me at this time i'll be having idli vada sambar at in at this darshni hotel at this time you call me you test i never tested it but this that, that's how tight his life was and it had to be that way because 
You know, there's so many things he was doing and had to be like that. But we bring that into worship with all this understanding, prophetic and all that, and say, okay, I've had my time of prophetic worship. I've had my time of personal worship. I've had my time of worship in this way. But we see in scripture that worship is much bigger than that. You know, can we all say much bigger? Much bigger. Right? We read in, I um, just want us to turn to uh, Hebrews 13 and verses 15 to 16. It says, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Verse 16, but do not forget. Forget to do what? To do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Saying, hey, you go before him, you offer the sacrifice of praise to him. He says, do not forget. In other words, you do this, but remember, when you do good, when you are generous, when you share, it is a well-pleasing sacrifice to God. With these sacrifices, God is well-pleased, which means that simple things, when we are kind, when we are generous, we are actually worshiping God. It's a sacrifice we bring before him. Kindness in word, kindness in deed. Kind in our words. You know, many of us, when we are pursuing a spouse, the words are very flowery. Poems, songs, right? Yes or no? Okay. Wrong audience. <laughs> Wrong illustration. Uh, but sometimes something happens after marriage. From all that poetic language and, you know, so on, we move to the language of hymns. <laughs> Let me explain. Do you want coffee? Mm. <laughs> want one more helping? Mm -mm. <laughs> the language of hymns. Right? But when we are kind with our words, it's our sacrifice to God. You know, I'm, you know, I'm preaching to myself. And, uh, you know, after the service, you can check with my wife. I do sing a lot of hymns, and I want to come out of that at the home, you know, in the home, in the house. Um, kindness with our words. Sometimes, you know, we, are, we pride ourselves on being brutally honest. Right? I want to speak the truth, I'll speak it, and I'll be honest about it, which is good. Some of us on the other extreme, truth, what is it? <laughs> but... Ephesians 4 verse 15 says, speak the truth in love. Right? Speak the truth in love. Um, is the food okay? Yes, yes. Do you want one more helping? No. <laughs> okay, we come to our own conclusions. Right? Speak the truth in love. I think I prefer some more salt. It's good. Good effort. Or, you know, God will give you creativity. But speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.29, you know, let's speak edifying words. You know, um, we speak the harshest words to the ones who are closest to us. You know, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children. You know, we speak harsh words. And words actually you know, are like bullets, are like arrows. Proverbs says, you know, there's one who speaks like the piercings of the sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Right? And we looked at words which are pleasant to the soul. So when we speak, when we are kind in our words, guess what? It's a well-pleasing sacrifice to God. Did you look at worship that way? I did not. It's a well-pleasing sacrifice. When we are kind in our actions, not just words, but in our actions, when we do things out of kindness. I was very inspired to, um, you know, to read in the papers about about this guy who would, um, uh, in one of the petrol bunks, he would go with a litter of uh, petrol after the bunks were closed. After, you know, not all bunks are 24 hours. So after the bunk is closed, he'll go and sit there for about an hour or two with a litter of petrol in one of those bottles. And the reason is this, 
because he says you know he noticed people who would come totally out of petrol just pushing their bikes and two wheelers and coming and coming to the bunk and seeing that oh the bunk is closed now what do we do so he says i just sit there and when these people come i just give them this and say okay no problem just take it i don't know if he st still does that but um, he used to do that in was in the papers acts of kindness random acts of kindness to people whom we do not know but especially to those in our house especially to those in our household so it's great that we you know with worship god in spirit and truth and but it's it is to bring before him a sacrifice that's well pleasing to him when we are kind in our words when we are kind in our actions when we share when we think of sharing and generosity we think of money right but god has given us resources more than money which is our talent our abilities our skills our time to invest in people to give to people when we are when we do that it is a sacrifice it's a sacrifice that is well pleasing to god and scripture says in second corinthians 9 and um, verse verse 6 onwards we read that god loves a cheerful giver the one who gives bountifully the one who through whom that god's name is glorified so god is calling us to a life of worship that's a life of kindness and generosity secondly we see uh in romans chapter 12 verses 1 and two, verse 1 it says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god so kindness and, uh, and generosity a sacrifice well pleasing to god here it says you present your body holy acceptable to god pure blameless separate from sin you present your body and it is a sacrifice that's pleasing him it is acceptable to god so notice the word you no know, living sacrifice which means as long as there is breath in our nostrils as long as we have life we need to do this it's not just one time it's not an event it's not certain day certain time but through life offer our body as a living sacrifice there are many things that we can do with our body we can live for sin we can live for unrighteousness but we can make righteous choices we can use our bodies to tempt others to seduce others we can use our bodies to control the lives of others to seduction to through temptation or we can choose to offer our body holy blameless pure before god that's worship that is also worship Yes it's good when we lift our hands and when we kneel down and we prostrate and you know clap our hands and jump it's great but the other aspect of worship is to bring our bodies holy pure before him and we see that in Romans chapter 6 verse 13 says do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness but present yourselves to god as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness our members what we see what we think what we speak what we handle where we go all aspects all aspects scripture saying you present yourself to god now don't let this be undone you do do all the other things but this is a living sacrifice it is acceptable to god so which means that you know i need to ask myself what are the things that i'm seeing is it acceptable things that i'm listening is it acceptable we must say oh no 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 don't don't be too rigid now we are under grace yes that's the best part we are under grace we, our identity has changed we are new creations so we are not ob obliged to live in sin anymore hallelujah we are released we are given that freedom to be slaves of righteousness and that's what we see in romans chapter 
and verse 18 and 19, it says, And having been set free from sin, praise God, a new identity, set free from sin, new creation. You know, how many of you have gone to Buhari's in Chennai? Buhari's, you know, those days, oh, a lot of hands, okay. So Buhari's, you know, I, uh, apparently it was a happening place, but the first time I went there, it was not. The menu, everything was tattered. Uh, it was very dark, dingy. You go there and, did you, do you have this? No. Do you have this? No. It was like that. And uh, off late, I went there and it's, it's totally different. They are under a new management. The furniture is different. The look, is, look and feel, the ambience is different. The menu is different. The food tastes great. You and I are under new management. Hallelujah. So our choices are different. We don't do anything to, you know, to come and please God and perform. No, no, no. We are under new management. We are not obliged to, to sin anymore. The scripture says that we are slaves of righteousness, which means the only obligation here, I'm obliged to live a righteous life. Yes, the pull of the flesh will be there because the flesh lusts out of the, against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, but hallelujah, we are more than conquerors. Sin shall not have dominion over us. Amen. Amen. So that is what we see. Is there an example in scripture? Oh yes, it is. There is. Joseph, Genesis 39. Old Testament. Some of us look at Old Testament. Oh, that's old. Oh. But you know, Old Testament, he didn't have the scriptures we have. Sold into slavery. Had everything to complain about. Family, not there. Church, not there. No fellowship, no quiet time, no life group. He's there. In Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife invites him to sin. Nobody will know. Everybody's far away. But how does Joseph respond? He says, I cannot do this great injustice against God. You know, wherever I go, there I am. And wherever I go, I can't run away from God. So Joseph, with this awareness, he says, how can I do this great injustice? My master has given me everything. That's his response. And it was not a one-time inducement to sin, one-time invitation. It happened over and over again. If you read that passage, you see that over and over again, continuously, continuously, he would report to work, Joseph, how about today? No. So we have an example in scripture. It is possible. Galatians, um, um, Galatians 5 and yeah, verse 16 says, walk in the spirit. Walk as led by the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. So we are invited to walk in the spirit. We are invited to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And lastly, we look at, um, you know, when we look at worship songs, when we sing these songs, these are songs of love. These are songs of adoration to God. We sing, God, I love you with all my heart, with everything within me. In fact, that is what the Lord wants us uh, to come to a place of, to a place of loving him with everything. And that's worship. That's adoration. The Lord says, love the Lord with all your heart, everything within you. The Lord also says in John chapter 14 and verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, if you love me, obey. Verse 21 of that same chapter, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who has, which means that in worship when we sing and we say, Lord, I love you, the Lord is saying, you know, my maths is slightly different. It's great that you're saying that you love me, but love equals obedience. Don't say, I will not obey God and still say, I will love you, Lord. Love equals obedience. Saying, in other words, you know, obedience is the language of intimacy. God, I will obey. 
when it's convenient, when it's inconvenient, when it's a sacrifice, when it's a dying to self, when we obey, we are actually proclaiming, declaring, and saying loudly, God, I love you. Lord, I love you. First Samuel 15, and um, the Lord gives Samuel an instruction to give King Saul to go against the army of Amalekites to destroy their livestock, everything. But Saul, he goes, he wins the war, he wins the battle against the Amalekites, but he leaves something. His obedience is only half. He leaves everything that he's supposed to destroy. He leaves it and he comes. And Samuel makes the statement. Prophet Samuel makes the same statement. He says, uh, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice, obedience, you know, both Yes, the Lord wants that. He's saying he esteems obedience. So the Lord is saying obedience. When we say, when we obey, we love God. When we obey, we actually worship him. So the Lord is actually inviting us. God is inviting us to a a life of kindness and generosity. A life of holiness, consecration. A life of obedience to him because that truly is a life of worship. That's a life of worship. And God is inviting all of us to that life. It's bigger than the song we sing. It's bigger than the all-night prayer that we spend time. It's bigger than whatever, you know, duration of prayer or worship. It's our life. He's inviting us to a life of worship. Because truly, this life is actually all about him. He gave it to us. He's given us his plans. He, he came to redeem us. He's redeemed us. We belong to him. He's released us into his plans and purposes. He's redeemed us from sin. And he's saying, now live for me. So the life of worship is life that is lived for him. Life that is lived for him. This is, uh, you know, morning we looked at a couple of things about prophetic and about a life of worship. But, you know, as a church, you know, uh, let it not be, okay, we studied that. We, you know, what's the next thing? But let's, let it be something that we live out. The recognition of who God is, reverence for God and submission to God, surrender to God. Let it be something that we live in, live out. Uh, if it's offering of sacrifice of praise, let it be something that we live out, expressing extravagant, bold, and pr- praise and worship. Let's something that we live out. The prophetic worship, let's be sensitive and receive what the Spirit of God is putting in our hearts. We sing it out, we declare it. Let our worship times be enriched. Let's engage with the heart of God. Let it be something that we live out. And holiness, kindness, generosity, and obedience. Let it be something that be part of our life as we live a life of worship. Amen. Let's just take this time to just um, go before God. Maybe there are some course corrections that we might, uh, we have to make. I have to make, you know, um, course corrections. As I'm preparing, I'm saying, oh, God, I'm sorry. You know, a checklist. God, I'm sorry. I need to change. I need to change, oh, God. You know, I, I need to look at worship as, as something that's my life, as I live my life. I need to change. And maybe, you know, you are feeling that way. So let's go before him and say, God, what are those things, God? You know, I, I didn't look at kindness this way, speaking kind words, especially to those in my family. Kind actions, generosity, with my time, with my abilities, with my resources, with my finances. God, you love a cheerful giver. Lord, my body, it is your holy temple. I've been bought with a price. Wherever I go, God, there you are. I'm coming back to you, Lord. Let my life just reflect your glory. Let my life be a life of worship. Let my my life be a song 
that's loudly proclaiming your virtues. You know, can we just tell the Lord that? Let my life be a song that's pleasing to your ears. Into my heart, into my heart. You know, this, is, this time, you know, the Lord never condemns, pushes away. He always receives. And His heart is for restoration. His heart is for, you know, redemption, to bring us back to the place where we have fallen in. And I, and I want to go before him and say, God, bring me back to that place. You're looking into my heart, oh Jesus. You're looking into my heart, into my heart. This is, life is all about you, all about you, Jesus. You're looking. Can I go? Where can I run away? God? You're looking into my heart, into my heart. You're looking into my heart. It's all about Jesus. Let me sing it out. You're looking into my heart. Again, you're looking into my heart, into my heart. When I say I love you, I want to do the things you call me to do. You're looking into my heart, into my heart. Oh, yes, God, I will present my members. What I see, what I hear, what I do, oh God, you see it, you see the motives of my heart. bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring, bring you more than a song even this song that I sing God bring you more than that God this life is bigger than that worship is bigger than I'll that I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more so much more than, than a song, than a song. us, Lord, with your own precious blood, we belong to you, God. Our body is not our own, but yours, God. And so, God, you exhort us, God, to glorify you, O oh God. To glorify you in our speech. Glorify you in our actions. Glorify you, O oh God, in the things that we say and do, God. In the things that we think, in the imaginations of our heart, God. May you be glorified. May you be lifted high. May you be lifted high, God. Coming back to the heart of worship, it's all about you, 
Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, the one who draws me, the one who receives me, the one who says, come to me, all those who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, I long to sit at your feet. Oh, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Okay, if you want to come back to God, now just go ahead and just tell the Lord, just sing out to Him and say, God, I'm coming back. I'll come about you. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. It is yours, God. Oh, it's all about, it's all about. Stand up and just sing your own song to the Lord and say, God, it's all about you. It's all about you. Just sing out. Just take that step of faith and say, you know, everywhere. You know, just sing out. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. Everyone, just sing out. Sing out to Him. It could be just one word, just one line. Just sing it out and say, It's all about you. you just sing out in tongues. kind of reiterate that you know so many times we compare human love uh, maybe the love of the father and say uh, because it falls so short of God's love and we compare and say okay God must be like that um, but God's love is unconditional it doesn't keep a record of wrongs and he wants us to experience that love he wants us to be in that love he wants us to, our lives to be changed to be transformed in that love and he wants to put his love in our hearts so that 
that love can flow out of us by the power of the holy spirit and as we as we journey on through life you know let's live that life let's live that life of worship is keeping him at the center of our lives let him being let him him being throned enthroned in our lives say god you have the best in store for me i put my hand in yours god and even as you lead i'll walk alongside to hear your whispers and i will declare that i will obey that i will do that and this is abundance life abundant life that you've called me to for the sun has come that we might have life and life in all its abundance a life of intimacy a life of obedience a life of abundance we thank you we thank you lord and may the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and fill you with his love fill you with his peace fill you with his joy fill you with his shalom for today and the days ahead amen amen god bless you have a great sunday and uh, have a great week ahead god bless we trust that this message was a blessing to you we'd love to hear from you you can email us at contact@apcwo.org at also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources thank you for listening and god bless you